Ryan Garreau, one of our speakers tonight, serves as an associate professor in the sociology department, as well as the associate dean for the core in the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences. Tara Pisani Garreau, our other speaker tonight, serves as an assistant professor of the practice in earth and environmental studies, as well as the acting director of the environmental studies program. Tara and Brian have been married for 19 years and have three children. That's incredible. <laughs> Um, they are here tonight to share with us their story, so let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Good evening. It's really nice to be here and to see so many familiar faces, and I imagine after tonight we'll see more of you in our office hours. <laughs> Maybe. I, I have a hard trouble believing that you know why we're here to talk or that you're here only to hear us talk. There m must be some wonderful desserts because we're here <laughs> to, tell us, to tell you about our love story. Ooh. <laughs> Do you know that? How many people knew that we're here to hear a love story? Uh, you knew. All right, so like seven, eight, nine of you. And some um, of you have probably heard snippets of it, but not yeah. the full story. So, um, wow. this it's, it's usually easy to speak in front of students. We kind of do it for a living, but I've never, I've never had to speak in front of a few hundred students and tell them our love story. <laughs> this is... Uh, it this reminds me of when we did our roasting before our wedding. Yeah, I, I bombed that too. Um, you, were, you were wonderful though. Thank you. Um, I try. So let's see. Um, when uh, Karen Kiefer invited us to, to give this talk for Agape Latte, we were, well, for one, we were really honored. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful organization and it's a wonder, wonderful thing that um, Boston College does for, for our students here. Um, I just want to tell you what we were asked to do. We were asked to um, to, uh, to share a story of how we see God working in our friendship, our relationship, and our marriage. Um, how can boss? A question we were we were asked to answer is how how can Boston College students learn about love and relationships through our story? How can our story help BC students as they begin their own journeys? So I guess um, you know since we were we were initially asked um, some time ago. We've spent a lot of time going through old photo albums and doing things that would bore you to tears, but someday you'll do it too. Um, and we were sort of re recounting the journey we've been on, and um, it's it's been a wild ride. It's 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 been pretty interesting. So um, we'll tell you a little bit about of it. We'll spend about. 20, 25 minutes doing so, and then we'll we'll open it up for questions so people can can ask us some details, and maybe we'll answer, maybe we won't. Um, so we have different different parts of our journey. Um, and the first part we're calling the Peace Corps: finding love through service and friendship. So, and here's our too small picture. Maybe some in the the front, the eager ones in the front can see it. Um, so first, we're gonna we're gonna talk about why we went we went into the Peace Corps, and it's something we know a lot of BC students think about. So maybe this will will be interesting. So Tara, we'll sure. start off with that. Okay, so I'm in front of a milpa or cornfield here, where there are some watermelons growing in these little lighter balls, and there are watermelons. I was a, a in my undergraduate time at at Virginia Tech. I was a crop and soil environmental science major. And so I, I had a good idea I wanted to do Peace Corps early in my college career. And I went down and I was a hillside farming extensionist, um, helping farmers on s grow crops on steep ground. So this area that you're seeing right here is like this flat plateau that's up high on a mountain. <laughs> so where the, the family had to get up there to irrigate. And I don't know if you can see, um, but there's sweat marks all over my shirt, and this was like the normal way every day. I never stopped sweating in Honduras. It was super hot, and the relative humidity was always high. We were in the southern um, southern Honduras, um, hot, deforested, um, but I loved that part of it, and uh, it was hard, but also really enjoyable. So, 
That's great. I would have left out the sweaty, the sweaty part. part, but that's okay. Well, so, it's a reality. Yeah. You know, like that's I'm good. proud of those sweat marks. Yeah. I worked hard for those sweat marks. You, you did. That's true. I'm, I stand corrected. And I don't get embarrassed if I sweat. <laughs> that's, that is certainly true. <laughs> so, so Tara was a good student since she entered kindergarten. And so she had a good idea of what to do and what her trajectory was, I think, for a very long time. She's probably the only Garden City, Long Island um, <laughs> person who went to Virginia Tech to study agriculture. I don't know how she even knew she wanted to study agriculture, but she did. So my, my story is less glorious. I went to mm -hmm. Providence College to play soccer, and that's pretty much the reason why I got into Providence College. Um, but while I was there, I, I learned a lot about um, ecology and environmental biology, and I learned about global warming and all these things that people talk about all the time now. They were just really um, in their nascent stages when I went to PC. Um, but I, I realized I, I wanted to do more than be a soccer player, and I knew I needed to learn more about how the world works. And so I went to the Peace Corps to I suppose, learn more about the world and to learn more about who I was. And I was also uh, a master's, master's student at Washington State University, so I went to the Peace Corps as part of the master's international program. And I went as an agroforestry extensionist, which means I worked with people that inhabit, it, that inhabit protected, area, protected areas um, in Honduras. Okay, so we, we did that for about a year. Tara worked, and, and we were friends at the time, but, but that, was, that was it. We, were we came in the same group. We were yep. Southern volunteers, um, and we were very good friends for a good, a good year or so. Right, right. Um, maybe saw each other every two or three months. That's about it. I was in a very remote area of southern Honduras. There was no electricity or running water. Mm -hmm. I was the first non-Honduran to live in this area. They weren't sure what to make of me, and Tara was closer to the capital city of Tegucigalpa, so we didn't see each other a lot, until Hurricane Mitch. So I don't know if you know, well, you probably don't. I don't even know if you were born when Hurricane Mitch happened, but back in, well. 1998. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. I, I have no idea how to gauge how old people are anymore. Um, anyways, um, yeah. back in 1998, um, right around my birthday, the largest hurricane to ever hit Central America hit Honduras quite directly. It sat over the country for several days and then went offshore. So our whole group in the Peace Corps was in their sights when this happened. My village really didn't have much warning at all. Um, as I said, the worst hurricane to hit Central America, um, there's some data here because Tara is good with data. So the highest levels of rain that ever fell in the south in recorded history during that period. Major bridges were destroyed. About 20,000 people in Central America were killed. And just for comparison, in for the, the death toll of Hurricane Katrina was 1,800 people. So 20,000 versus 1,800. And about 11,000 of them died in, in Honduras. So there were 200 Peace Corps volunteers in Honduras at the time. Um, a week after the hurricane, there were six volunteers who still hadn't been removed from the country because they couldn't get at them. One of them was Tara, who was eventually um, evacuated in a helicopter, and I was the other one of the six, and I walked to the El Salvador border after several days of figuring out what to do. Um, and. I think through the grace of being a U.S. citizen, and I suppose this brings up political issues, I didn't mean to, but I basically walked across the border, got a new passport, and went to Panama, where we had two months of sort of post-traumatic stress um, training, I guess, and um, that's really where Tara and I met for the first time in a new way. Yeah, especially I think because we were, um, a a very small group of people who were arriving a week late to Panama City when all the other volunteers had successfully evacuated. And just to give you some idea, imagine like if you're, you were gone for a week and your parents didn't hear anything from you. So there was no cell phone in our sites. There was no way to communicate with anyone that we were okay. Um, in my case, I was planning on hiking out of my site. It was two hours by bus 
and the, the road was covered with mud all over, and I was a part of a team of people to try to dig us out, but that didn't get us too far. Um, and food was running out really quickly, so I was gonna head, because I'm a hiker, I said, I'll, I'll head for the Pan American Highway. Yeah. Um, but the day that I was planning to hike out, the clouds cleared enough for a helicopter to land and take me out. So. Yeah. So a lot more could be said there, but we'll, we'll leave it at that. You yeah. can ask questions if you want. Um, but I'd say I'd say about 50% of the volunteers who are currently in Honduras decided to go home after that time. But um, even even I suppose even though we had started a relationship in Panama, we both decided to go back to Honduras and to finish our our service there. So this would be another year, year. Mm -hmm. in in Honduras. And we know we'd be living apart. Um, we knew we wouldn't see each other very much, but our commitment to our villages and our commitment to the to the work that we were doing was, I suppose, as in, as important as uh, the love that we were we began to have for one another. Mm -hmm. And we knew we would always have that, and that it was important for us to start off, you know, doing the right thing. And so. Um, we went back to Honduras, and I went to my little village in Choluteca, mm -hmm. and or and Tara went to hers in Raytoka, mm -hmm. and <laughs> yeah, there were no cell phones. I had an email account. I didn't know how to use it. This was this was like pre-email days, mm -hmm. um, but and I didn't tell Tara I was going to say this, but the way we communicated was was we would um, we would tell each other that we would think about each other at a certain time at night and I know I heard I heard that from some of you <laughs> and um, and we would kind of talk to each other without being near each other but mm -hmm. that was that was kind of cool mm -hmm. yeah and we did have um, a couple of interesting experiences because after the hurricane there were no bridges so to get to my site you had to take a bus to the river, then take a canoe across the river, and then take another bus, and everyone's running for the second bus to get a seat, because <laughs> um, now it doesn't matter if you're an early bird or not, everyone's running to get on there. And one time when Brian was coming to my site, there was a young boy in almost a full body cast, right? I mean, he had this full thing where he had to stand. I don't know what happened, but Brian, we. Brian had him on his lap during part of that journey and then took him on the boat across the across the river. Um, <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good sign that, I <laughs> that I'd chosen wisely. <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't do that anymore. I'm too old. I, I'll do it next time. Here's, this is where like I would be rolling my eyes if my parents did this, but here, here's just a picture of our, of our Peace Corps friends. Not that you know any of them, but this brings back <laughs> lots of memories. I'm the I'm the guy in the Washington State University shirt that you probably can't see, and yeah. Tara's the one to the left of me. At this point, we're engaged, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure I'd recommend that. I'd yet to meet her parents, and um, <laughs> that was that was an interesting conversation from Tegucigalpa to Garden mm -hmm. City, New York. But they were very they were very happy with us. But I hope my kids don't do that to me. <laughs> And and uh, this was at one of our visits to Brian or my visit to Brian's site where that's where we got engaged. Um, and Those are not our children. Not our kids, but <laughs> kids who clearly had no problem hanging out with us. No, we like we like kids. Yeah, yeah. that's why we teach. All right. So part two is going to be a shorter one because we were mindful of the time. Um, so this is called the <laughs> the Patagonia pre-marriage adventure. This is still this is sort of pre. Um, Common sense, the pre-common sense era of our marriage. Okay, um, do you want to take this? Or? Okay, well, hold on, so you, okay. I'll hold it up. So, uh, and when we, the reason why Brian's saying that is because when you you get out of the Peace Corps, they give you at that time we had like a stipend of a little over five thousand dollars each, and we said, well, what should we do with that money? We're getting married. Let's not save it. Let's go down to Patagonia and go trekking. Um, before we get married. So we went down to Patagonia for two months, um, and we did a number of hikes between Chile and Argentina, and um, climbed snowy volcanoes, um, crossed precipitous <laughs> uh, trails, were windblown. It was really an amazing experience in a gorgeous landscape. Um, and so this, did you show the picture here? I did, they, they saw it. So 
But we were carrying a lot of stuff with us. <laughs> and we have some jokes too because um, we're trying to hike with as little weight as possible. So one of the, our survival techniques was to eat dehydrated baby food that was called Blevit. <laughs> and we had a little song to sing to Wait, help. I have to sing it? Yeah, you, got, you said you were going to sing it. A spoonful of Blevit helps the medicine go down. I'm stopping. That's it. Yeah, that's anyway, it. Four, four, 14 days on a trail eating baby food brings out the best in you. <laughs> it was actually a really great learning experience in a lot of ways. You know, we learned a lot about each other. We learned mm -hmm. a lot about ourselves. We had our mm -hmm. first argument. We did. Oh, and we both the remember classic. it. I was completely wrong. But I th it's funny because I think I was completely wrong. Yeah, you were. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I suppose th the best part of going to Patagonia was it was totally spontaneous and it didn't make sense to anyone. It was one of the best things mm -hmm. we ever did. And look, we have jobs and we're <laughs> doing fine we today. Okay. So if you have some wonderful idea you want to do, I'd I'd say do it, but don't tell your parents I said that. Um, okay, so part three. This is when things get a little more serious. This is called marriage in graduate school. Marriage. Okay, so as Tara had mentioned, what well, little money good. we had, we, we spent on going to Patagonia to go hiking, and then we got married, and it was a truly a Long Island wedding. I don't know if that means anything to you, but yes, was that was all a part of it. Beautiful. And it was beautiful, and we got some lovely gifts, and then we moved out to Washington State University because, as I said, I was in a master's program, and so Tara inherited that. In the northwest, this is the Palouse region, like rolling wheat fields. Be a beautiful place. So. Um, but we, we, I was in school, and we basically lived off of whatever Tara could earn, and we spent everything we got at our wedding trying to survive. <laughs> so we spent a year at Washington State University. Um, we did meet some wonderful people. They taught us a lot about um, what we think is important in life. We met some folks who really um, just enjoyed the simplicity of life, conversation, not turning on a TV, but taking out dulcimers and banjos and singing songs and making your own cider and making your own bread and chickens having chickens which we still do even in Concord and um, you know just learning learning to live in the moment and I think that's something we, we we're always striving to do more of where I wouldn't I wouldn't say we're terribly good at it but it's something that we even teach our students about the importance of being present and discerning what is mm -hmm. important to you, what things mean to you, and, and why your education is important. We were doing the same thing in graduate school, trying to take a step back and to take seriously what we learned and what it meant to the ways we wanted to live in the world. Okay. So then we went to, a year later, we went to Santa Cruz, California. And we started, uh, at this point, I started my graduate program um, in the environmental studies program. And it, UC Santa Cruz, if you haven't checked it out, it's a beautiful campus that sits above the Monterey Bay and has beautiful views. And one of the things I was very lucky to do, I'm showing you a picture of oh. the farm there, the Agroecology Center and Sustainable Food Systems. Um, and there I was able to TA and learn a lot about agroecology in this beautiful setting. Um, and here we were in Santa Cruz for about eight years. Um, it, the weather is always beautiful. Everyone says another day in paradise. People surf and are outside. And it was a really wonderful place to go to graduate school and do our PhD work. Yeah, yeah, it was a wonderful place. And we had a great time. We made really good friends. Um, we had a lovely little house up in um, the Santa Cruz Mountains, if anyone knows the area, um, in, uh, in Felton. And... Um, we did lots of hiking, and we, we had good friendships with, with a lot of our friends in grad school. I guess the hardest part for us was probably being so far from family. And um, also, it was kind of maybe because it was a state school or maybe because we were young and not terribly comfortable blending worlds. I, I don't know. Um, I was certainly <laughs> even less mature than I am now. But... Um, we we didn't we we found it kind of difficult to to blend our professional work with our um, our spiritual um, lives and our personal lives. 
um, I'm so, sort of jumping the gun here, but it's, I think one, one of the wonderful things about coming back to the East Coast and, and being at Boston College in particular is that it's, it's, it's very easy to work on those different areas of your life all in one place. And, you know, I went to a Catholic school as an undergrad, and I'm not sure I understood how much of a blessing that was until I was an adult years later. Um, but that was, that was a bit of a challenge. I mean, it is truly paradise. The weather is literally perfect in Santa Cruz. Um, but that, that was something that was missing. So we never, I don't know, I, I don't know if we ever articulated it well, but we we, were, we never intended to stay in Santa Cruz forever. Well, and I forever. think in part our religious life was apart from our graduate school life, and so yeah. we didn't really have a, uh, we went to a church in Santa Cruz, but we didn't have a, a strong community within our church there that we, you know, people we hung out with, our grad student friends were separate from that. I yeah. think that's the main point. Yeah. That's good. That was said a lot easier and quicker than I <laughs> said it. Um, let's move on to... Oh, I want to oh. say one thing before we... Our part four. I was trying to skip um, this. Yeah. So one of the things we did in like the first uh, couple of years of our marriage is we did this workshop called Getting the Love You Want. And actually it was Brian's parents who who recommended that we do something on, like, on building your relationship. And you kind of think when you're newlyweds within a couple years we don't need this you know we're in love and things are going really well but we did it we went to this place called Esalen you should look it up it's if you can have a chance to go there you should go um, and we learned a lot in that workshop and there's this book called Getting the Love You Want and um, one of the th I'll read you a quote from here that's sort of helpful um, he says marriage is a psychological Oh, sorry, marriage is not a static state between two unchanging people. Marriage is a psychological and spiritual journey that begins in the ecstasy of attraction, meanders through a rocky stretch of self-discovery, and culminates in the creation of an intimate, joyful, lifelong union. Whether or not you realize the full potential of this vision depends not on your ability to attract the perfect mate, but on your willingness to acquire knowledge about hidden parts of yourself, and so a lot of this is about at some point when the romance <laughs> embers dim down, um, you hit real life and, you, and there are power struggles when two people trying to work out how to make a life together. Um, and so you have to work on this stuff inside yourself. And one of the metaphors that they gave in this workshop that I've always held on to was that we're kind of like cypress trees growing on the coastline where the predominant winds of our upbringing and culture kind of prune us in a particular direction. And so when we're attracted to someone who might be a little different from us, or maybe even the opposite in certain ways, it's our self trying to, trying to grow in that other part of, of, of what we're meant to be. So in a perfect union, we kind of grow in that other side of the tree and, and change the winds. And I really feel like that's something that, I mean, we're similar in our interests, but we have different approaches and different ideas and different ways of, of, of being. And so um, we try to bring out the best in each other. And I think that's a really good question to ask yourself when you're thinking about who's, who's your mate for life or even for a particular time. Does this person allow me to be the best person I can be? Am I, am I, are they helping me to grow where I need to grow? In order to answer that, you've got to kind of look inside yourself. I, I'd clap if I wasn't speaking with you. That was, that was great. <laughs> it that didn't come out half it was articulately lovely. when I was trying to explain it before to that you. That was great. <laughs> it's, it's actually a perfect segue into part four, <laughs> <laughs> having a family because I think having children is another opportunity to grow in, in new ways, to become a, a wholer person. Mm -hmm. But it's also important to remember, I think, to, to also allow your children to become whole persons and, and not, and, and you can't always, you, well, you certainly can't predict what kind of person they will become, but you have to be supportive of, of that. And that's, that's easier said than done. Yeah. Um, okay, so. So we're going to talk a little bit about having kids. That was like the, our next big stage in our life. Um, and so going into having our very first child, I don't know about Brian, but I definitely had a lot of fears. <laughs> because the way that birth, childbirth is portrayed on television is that it's a horrible experience of labor, right? 
Um, and so I was worried that I would say the wrong thing, say something really mean, that he would say something wrong or do something wrong. And and if you think about you know the way it's portrayed, you probably are understanding where my fears may have come from and maybe what you might be thinking too. And the very first picture in our daughter's um, baby book is a picture of us during labor, not after birth. And it's because our midwife took all these pictures of us without us knowing. <laughs> and, and, and she said, I had to take the pictures, and I, didn't, I don't have them here, I'm sorry. Um, because uh, I have it them was on my phone. <laughs> no, oh, it, it was it was so beautiful, and and so I on her in her baby book I say our labor of love, um, and because when we walked into that maternity center, um, we we actually left all of our bags in the car, thinking that uh, we would come back and get them. And O'Brien thought, oh well, let's just go check in and we'll you know get going. And and we never came back for our bags. We were in there for hours together working, and I think it was one of the most bonding experiences for us. It brought us to a different level than, than what we'd had before. And, and so we are really fortunate that we were able to have three children um, through natural childbirth, and it's something that um, I thought was really beautiful. So did you show our picture? I showed this that one. This our, is yeah. our cute little nugget, <laughs> Delphine, who's That's number one. <laughs> yes. Um, well, she has a name. She's not number one, but <laughs> but you can tell we're like, yeah, we did it. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, um, we we had two children while in graduate school, which is not what they advise you to do. Um, but to be honest, I I think it was really perfect. Um, we I I I don't know if we planned it, but we certainly weren't disappointed when when it happened um, and it really just made our experience really special it also helped us finish really fast mm -hmm. I wore <laughs> I wrote one of my faster for you than for me yeah fast <laughs> well that goes without yeah. saying maybe but I just remember um, yeah all right I'm gonna I'm not gonna go off on a tangent but it, it did um, focus us and and give us purpose I think mm -hmm. that some of our some of our colleagues didn't have um and it also just made it really really special i mean we certainly didn't have any money to do anything mm -hmm. the honduran diet came home we ate beans and rice a lot um our our oldest daughter spent a lot of time playing under the stairs this is before harry potter um but when she saw harry potter she was like that's where i used <laughs> to play I'm like well actually it's kind of sad for him it was nice for you but that's depressing now um <laughs> Anyway, um, and then we had our second child, Beatrix, um, close to the end. Actually, Tara almost, you almost gave birth in a Mini Cooper. It, we were, lived really far from the hospital. Um, anyway, so maybe you could ask about that if you want to <laughs> later. <laughs> or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, and again, um, I guess one, one of the important lessons of graduate school was really preparing for postgraduate school. So, you know, the goal of getting a PhD is to get a job. And I don't know if you've heard, but it's not easy for two PhD um, holding people to get a job at the same university. And you just really don't know whether the job you get or one of you or the other is going to be um, the, the one that makes sense for your family. So it can be really stressful and it can be really difficult and you know, I think we're really happy now. Mm -hmm. um, of course, it's a process, and it'll go on. But um, this w this couldn't have been predicted um, at any stage of our professional lives that we would both be sitting here talking to you about our intimate lives at Boston <laughs> College, one of the the greatest universities in the in the country, if not the world. Um, it's really it's really amazing to think about. Mm -hmm. So did you mention about um, our house in the woods? You said that? I said it was small and we had no money. Okay. Well, we didn't have money, but the one of the things we had were these beautiful walks. So I don't know if you can see. This is this is Delphine, like less than a year old. And, and we would do this walk over to the this Vista, um, or Vista, um, that's the drinking water reservoir for Santa Cruz called Loch Lomond. 
And we were able to do this almost every day with our dogs. It was beautiful. So even it was simple and and we lived simply, but with a lot of richness. Okay, so part five. This is the last part. <laughs> Breathe a sigh of relief. Our formation at Boston College. So I don't know. Some we've we've noticed many faces of people have been in our classes, either my freshman topic course or global implications of climate change or Terra's agroecology courses or ecosystems, water oh. resources, environmental seminar. Yeah. Give it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, but it's funny because there there are very few events where we both appear together, and actually that's kind of this the 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 continuous joke we get from our colleagues is that when they do see us at an event, it's one or the other. Well, that's that's because we have three kids, and we love participating in these events. I mean, this is one of the highlights of, of what we do. I think service is, is huge for both of mm -hmm. us, service to BC. Um, but we can't often do it together because we have to balance our family life with our, with our professional lives. Um, and we both coach our kids' soccer teams. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, we both coach. We both have full lives, as, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, but we, there are occasions where we where, where we do things together. Um, it tends to be around um, uh, events related to the church or um, graduation mm -hmm. or when we're asked to promote um, something to do with the core curriculum and one of the courses that we taught. Um, there are times when it, it's necessary for us to be together. Uh, the other times we're together is doing research. So we've We've, our latest project involves Tara and I working together on a, on a cranberry project. The short story is we're looking at cranberries and climate change. Mm -hmm. I do it from a sociological perspective. Tara does it from a natural science perspective. Um, we're both publishing together, which is really interesting and fun. And as I said, we teach together, um, which, which has been really fantastic. Um, some married couples don't know how we do that, but I think maybe we have a better we marriage than some of them. We get jokes about that too. For <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I guess I guess the latest um, formative experience is is that Tara's the director of the environmental studies program, and I'm the associate dean for the core curriculum. So we both have some positions that demand more of our time, and you know we're trying to find a way to balance that mm -hmm. new step in our professional lives with our spiritual lives and our family lives and our personal lives. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, as with the rest of our journey, that's, that's a process and we're still figuring it out and I don't, I don't think w that will ever end, but we should never stop trying to make it better for everyone who's a part of our lives. Mm -hmm. Including all of you and um, I'm sure you know, it's there have been times where I, I'm more culpable than anyone else and like haven't been able to respond to an email as quickly as maybe students would like. And we're trying. It's not that we don't care about you and want to be with you, but keep being persistent with us because we do want to have those conversations. And that's like the joy of what we do here, really, is when we have time with you guys. You want to show this one? Yeah. So that's our... That's our kids, relatively recently. Now we are five. Now we're older. <laughs> and we have to show over here, too. Okay. Um, so this is Delphine, our firstborn, and our son, Lionel. Um, they had their first communion and first baptism on the same day. And in part, you know, you, you try to do multiple things when you've got a lot to go on. <laughs> and it was actually a really beautiful day. It, was, it allowed everyone to come and celebrate two special occasions for our kids. Um, they're actually not this little anymore, believe it or not, because um, we still look so young like that, right? Well, you do. Yeah. I, I don't. Um, let's do, show this one. This is our recent one. All right. And this is the last thing, we promise. Okay. So this is now our almost grown-up kids. Well, at least one is in high school now, which is still shocking to us that we have a high schooler. Um, and y what we say now for our kids is everyone has to contribute. You have to be a contributor to the family <laughs> and help out. Um, and then we do have one more in here. Oh, you gotta stop. Okay. Okay. 
I had the graduation one. That's all right. Okay. Well, I, well, I shouldn't order you around. I'm sorry. Th thank you. Thank <laughs> yeah, you. Thank you. <laughs> Would it, uh, does anyone dare to ask a question? You do, yes. Oh, great. Want me to start? Yeah, go ahead. All right, so the question was, maybe there are some people here that are starting to have feelings for someone else, and based on our experiences, what advice would we give? Well, to be honest, I, I think, I mean, <laughs> so go into the Peace Corps, <laughs> tell them to come, and m see them about once every month to kind of feel out whether that's the person for you. But to be honest, that that's I don't think that's a bad approach. Um, <laughs> You could do a modified version where you slowly get to know someone and don't feel like you have to rush into any kind of relationship. I mean, my goodness, you have your whole life, so what's the rush? Um, I think one of the, the best ways that we were able to realize that we were a good match for one another was that we, we took our time. We took our time to, um, to get to know one another. And you know that's so countercultural that it probably doesn't even make sense, but I think it's critical. It's kind of like the slow food movement of relationships. We need the slow relationship movement, <laughs> and I think we'll have happier relationships if people reflect on you know the the experience. Thank you. Yeah, oh. I I also think when I reflect on my own life that. Um, like Brian's nickname for me is Logos, because <laughs> I'm so I, I'm, I operate logical. in the logical part of my brain a lot, and but with relationships, I went. That was the one area where I really listened more to my heart than to my head. And if I were to look at it on paper, it probably wouldn't have made sense from many of the decisions that we made. Um, it f it felt right, and I kind of knew from my experiences with other partners in my life that 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 were temporary but th I just knew that wasn't going to be forever and so that's why she asked me to marry her <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying more than that she did in a chicken coop Yeah, I mean, um, we we have a garden and chickens, um, and we you know we are definitely as a family unit. We have a house and we have solar panels to try to offset our our electricity or provide electricity for our needs. Um, and it, but it's a balance because there's a lot of societal pressures, especially for our kids. You want the th new things that are out and. Um, if we were living in a different place, I think in many ways it would be a lot easier than when you're surrounded by the cultural pressures. Um, but we certainly aim to live more simply, and one of the way ways we do that is also by producing less trash. Um, and we compost all of our, our organic waste from the kitchen, and that really helps, and recycle just about everything else. So that's one of the ways that we try to live really lightly on the land, although it still has an impact, for sure. I'd say the Peace Corps really had an impact on what we do professionally. You mm -hmm. know, it, it, I still write about my, my experience in the Peace Corps. It's still part of our, of our teaching. It's a part of the topics that we do research on. You know, it's, it's, it, it was incredibly impactful um, for both of us. Mm -hmm. Other here questions? In the corner. Oh, good question. We went on we went scuba diving. We went to the Bay Islands um, and Copan. Copan. Lots of cool Mayan ruins in Honduras. Mm -hmm. um, 
we hung out a lot. So we'd yeah. meet out in Choluteca, the southern city that was really hot. We'd go watch a movie, go eat somewhere, and hang out. We played. We so actually, when we were um, this is when we were hiking. And this, I don't know if you call it a date, but like you're inside of a tent for a long time. And one time there was a, a big um, whiteout and we were in the tent all day. So we made little chess pieces and played chess inside of our tent and <laughs> things like that. Is that exciting? <laughs> the spark. I have to say we had the most spectacular first kiss I think I've ever heard of. <laughs> <laughs> At least I ever experienced. Well, tell it. All right. Do you want to hear it? So we were all we it was we were in Panama and recovering from Hurricane Mitch stuff, and all of our um, friends were out one night. There was going to be a big meteor shower, and so we all got on the lawn and we we're all really excited for it and heard really cool things. And the hours went by and it was well past the time when it was supposed to happen. And our friends said. All right, we're heading, we're heading in, we're done. It's not, it's probably tomorrow night. So everyone went in and it was just us. And it was all of a sudden like fireworks in the sky. It was bizarre. I almost feel like I imagined it. Like <laughs> but it was the most beautiful thing we've ever seen. Since I've never seen anything since that, right? That was our first kiss. That was a pretty so good date. Top that. Go that ahead. Was, that was <laughs> that was a great date. <laughs> yeah. That is a very good question. Good. So the question was, when we're both really busy trying to f do what we have to do at the job, how do we s keep focused on one another, basically? Mm -hmm. Wow, have we figured that out? Well, you know, we, we try to make time to go out to one of our favorite restaurants where we just kind of unwind and relax, and it's really close by. And, and also, we're kind of excited this summer because we have a new bike path that just opened up. And so we're excited now we can bike to that restaurant and not have to drive there, which will be really lovely. We also do a lot of walking around our house. We live near um, a pond where our kids go swimming. And usually around sunset or so, we like to go for a nice walk. And we try actually really hard not to talk about work <laughs> and to just have some quiet in yeah. our day. Um, usually one of our, our youngest is off with a big stick and, you know, s doing something like that. But I mean, we, we welcome our children to come out with us. Our kids have always been a really big part of our life. Um, and we don't try to compartmentalize that too much, but we also try to take some time for ourselves to get out, but we, ha you have to be intentional about it. And every once in a while we go, we haven't done that in a while because we've been so busy. So yeah. we have to do it. Yeah. It's, it's maybe it sounds a little kind of lame but you you do have to be intentional about finding time to sp to spend together yeah um you know some we, we even s look at our calendars and you know you know i'm i'm going to give a talk on the core this coming weekend so we can't expect well one you know if if we know it's coming then we we we're not going to get upset with one another um and then we plan something afterwards you know so there there are times when work takes over and mm -hmm. we just have to go with it but we're trying and we, we're good at communicating about that i think our next step is to teach our kids more about how we need to balance too because we don't want them to feel like you know we're not spending time with them although our kids see us more than i ever saw my parents I, mean, I my dad was at work at he left at six he came home at six and then he went to bed and he woke up and he did it again I mean, i'm so grateful for what he did for me but you know i'd really like to be a more part of my kids lives if if I can but I think we're gonna that's it's a constant process you know you got to keep working at it and one of the things that we do too we have a tradition where <laughs> for grade submission <laughs> <laughs> oh don't give that oh, all, right. all right I right, won't do that one uh, <laughs> we celebrate I, when grades are submitted <laughs> we do we go out there's a period between submitting the grade and the start of the emails and, yeah. and during that period, we, we usually go out to eat or something. Yeah. <laughs> and then also, our um, 
our, we, our wedding day was on May 20th, and it's kind of cool because it's that's right around commencement time, and actually that t that period of time after school and when our kids are still in school is one of our sweet spots in our year because yeah. it's like our email load goes down. We don't have to. We're not teaching. We're not great. We're all done. Grades are submitted, and it's just the two of us. I mean, that's really fun. Like, and I just we have great careers we're really we always feel really fortunate that we get to be professors and have like wonderful work and then also wonderful rest periods to recharge and to be with each other and to be with our kids in the summer too yeah. away in the back hello your what life faith life Oh, how to say that. It's had a very profound impact, I would say, on our lives. Um, both being together and having children. Um, you know, we, we started out in a state school. And um, a state school that really didn't have m much of a, a student body connection with um, a p any particular religion. And so I think our attitude towards, you know, wanting to stay involved in a, in a church was one that was bolstered by us being together. You know, I mean, like I said before, it's, it's a real blessing to be at BC. I mean, you have, you can go to mass any day of the week, and just walk to St. Mary's. There's no problem whatsoever. It w that that's that was hard in graduate school. There wasn't any obvious, you know, way to stay connected to to a church. And so I think, you know, and you're busy as 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 you all are. You know, we're constantly busy. So just having a partner to, um, you know, to encourage one another to stay connected to our church was was really important. Um, we met a really amazing priest, Father Cyprian. Oh. Remember him? Oh yeah. He was such a he was such a California priest. He combined like Buddhism with Catholicism, and mm -hmm. he would teach in this. He he would you called him Cyprian, and you know he's kind of kind of like some Jesuits we know. He called by his first name, which I did not grow up doing, um, with Catholic priests. And he baptized Delphine. And he baptized our first mm -hmm. daughter, and you know. So I think being together just helps support that the the growth early on in particular and I don't know if well you wanna it was interesting so before I met Brian I mean I was raised Catholic but I think during my college years like 18 on I I stopped practicing and going to church and um and then when you're in the Peace Corps um and in Honduras in particular there's kind of some division between Protestants and Catholics and like they're like who are you with you know and you're kind of like I'm neutral right now because <laughs> um, you don't want people to feel like you're favoring them or not so and maybe that was the easy way out for me during those years um, and then with Brian I sort of felt like I was then coming back to the church and actually really interestingly our very first job after Peace Corps we were hired but we went in to meet the pastor who was going to marry us um, in the church that um, in my hometown and he hired us to run these social justice workshops and he, and so we got to know the priest who married us really really well over that next several months and um, and in that part was really wonderful because then for actual wedding was like just a phenomenal wedding like the service itself like the way he gave his homily was just so special yeah. to us um and and so it is a journey i think and i feel like for me at least it's been more like to come back to the church when i when i had doubts about many things so i, I don't know yeah. one more we one have more, one, one two more. three okay oh one i don't know <laughs> it doesn't matter this is kind of fun I, yeah in the <laughs> back Go ahead. Yeah, in the back. Mm. 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 
you you didn't doubt. I, that's the yeah, problem. Yeah, that's she, for she me. She knew what she wanted to do. I didn't know people in the Peace Corps who did doubt. And that one thing I thought was interesting is that that they their one of their doubts was they felt that two years was was really long, um, and that they weren't sure they could kind of sacrifice the two years of their life. And I think my outlook for Peace Corps was that it's not a sacrifice. This is who I am. This is my service to the world. And I'm really happy to be here. And and I think that changed the thinking. Because if you're, if you're kind of stuck in like being homesick and always thinking that like your life is back home and not there in the present, then that's hard. Yeah. So I think you have to think deeply about if that's the right move for you and just embrace it and it goes really fast yeah. then um grad school uh, yeah i mean i don't know i think they were really fun years and i think we kind of knew uh, you knew more that you were going to grad school and i didn't actually know for a while and then i actually was in the peace corps at some point where i realized i kind of had plateaued with some of my knowledge and i wanted to go back to learn more um I'll just add quickly, I doubted graduate school because I didn't get into the school I wanted to get into. Mm -hmm. And that really bummed me. And I wasn't looking forward to it terribly. The best part was that there was this connection to the Peace Corps. But it turns out that Washington State University was fantastic. You know, I had a great time. I met good people and it helped me get here. So it couldn't have been that bad. Mm -hmm. um, but that can be difficult, you know, when things aren't turning out the way you think they will. Um, you could begin to doubt, but um, in, in our experience, I think working hard, staying true to yourself, mm -hmm. being honest and s courageous can, can lead to good things. Mm -hmm.